Okay, we are recording. So this is the first meeting of the uh, Dalton Collective. And the, uh, the meeting today, uh, being the first meeting, uh, the only thing we have on the agenda is to talk about what it might mean for a star to be collectively owned, in this case, Dalton. Uh, this is the star that I, I previously owned and now I'm donating to the Dalton Collective, of which I don't even know what that is. I'm just helping to get the thing started because I think it would be an interesting thing to, to think about and, and participate in. And so we have a few folks uh, here on the call today. And then I'm also going to take some notes and we might have some uh, action items at the end or we might not. We might have some people joining in later. Uh, the meeting is open to the public. So that's where we, uh, that's where we are. So we just had one other person join. So just to be, make everybody aware, this is being recorded. So um, just keep that in mind. Okay, so really, um, if, if, if I could just give some background on this, this idea or um, before we get started, if that's all right. Um, so I've, I've uh, had a few experiments in my sort of professional career on how to do sort of collaborative projects or, uh, and, you know, that and to some extent, most of them have had some success, but not, not, nothing that I would consider a true sort of decentralized autonomous organization, something like that. Um, not that I think that this group should aim for something like that, but this group should be self-directed. So if that's what it wants to be, that that's actually kind of cool. Um, I've been part of uh, co-ops in the past as well, and I could very much see how a cooperative structure could be beneficial for collective management of a star, of an orbit star. And uh, just to give a, an idea of what that might look like, the uh, like a really traditional co-op at least the one that I'm familiar with is like orchard growers in like, um, like apple fields. So you might have four or five different uh, farmers and they all pool their resources together uh, to create a larger brand that then goes and sells those apples to market. They might own and operate a storefront, a bunch of other things that they do um, as a collective economic unit. And the way I see uh, stars working out, or at least one way I can see them working out um, as businesses, not just of, selling planets is to be actually to become businesses like internet service providers. So they might uh, charge for the, the service of peer discovery, but I, I don't think that that's, I mean, it's a very important service, but it's not exactly, um, you're not going to be able to charge a lot of money for that. So that's not going to be a real great business though. Um, things like bandwidth, compu maybe, maybe computation, but probably storage, uh, hard drive space, that kind of stuff. I could certainly see uh, charging, um, planets to use those services, especially in a federated model. And so if a star was being, or a group of stars were being collectively run together, they could sort of team up and offer um, those resources. And then, uh, you know, the, the planets underneath them could um, pay them collectively. They also have a uh, yeah, higher reputation that's coming from the, yeah, financial escrows. There's all kinds of things you can do in a sort of cooperative collective manner. Um, I'm not really suggesting here that, that this thing be a, um, you know, a, a special purpose vehicle for something, though it very well could be. But that's sort of my idea. Um, so in order to get it rolling, I just took a star that I had purchased way back during the, um, some of the initial uh, crowd sales that Urbit had done, and I'm going to donate it to this group. And then Watch what happens. <laughs> um, so that's, and, and I'm Kenny, by the way. Um, I'm a contractor for Talon, in case you didn't know that. Um, I, my, my other background is I was an early contributor to MakerDAO. Uh, for a while, I worked on a project called Archain, which was a cooperative-based blockchain project. Um, did some consulting with CoinFund, which is also a Galaxy owner and um, Aragon, which is like sort of a decentralized autonomous organization, like a WordPress for decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, yeah, so that's me. Um, if we could sort of maybe go around and see, uh, you know, what, who, who, who's here and why you're here and kind of what your thoughts are. I, I'd really like to hear from you too. I'd be happy to jump in just because of, uh, just because of association, I'm also, uh, a member of Tlan. I'm one of the designers working on the various interfaces for um, OS 1 and 2, and a little bit of bridge for any of you who've, uh, who've uh, 
worked with any of those uh, applications. And um, I basically hopped onto this because I have a really deep interest in seeing what ideas might form around how uh, ships in orbit are managed by multiple groups of people. The sort of long-standing thesis that I have is that um, at least maybe in the near future, I can imagine many ships will probably be owned by one person at a time, one person per ship, so to speak. But um, as the platform hopefully gets more and more popular, I would imagine that rather than that sort of mapping from a person to a ship, we could almost imagine ships as being uh, these mechanisms to work with uh, human scale sizes, like sizes of people. So like families or um, like a school, for example, like a class, or maybe even a company or a startup could map itself to a, to a ship. And um, I'm basically just tailing uh, this uh, collective project to see how that goes and see if it sort of births any ideas for any, any interfaces around that basically. And that's it. Thanks, Ed. And my name's uh, Ed, by the way. I don't, I didn't mention that. Yeah. Anyone else wanna? I'll jump yeah. in. <clears throat> I yeah. am a, a, a founder in the uh, ETH DeFi space. I'm very excited about what's going on in Urbit and I'm actually mostly just here to learn. Um, I have a, a pretty good idea of what Urbit is, but at the same time, uh, you know, want to learn more and, and participate, you know, I figure participating in the discussion is the best way to do that. Cool. Yeah, actually, same here. I'm like, saw it on Twitter, a bit curious, um, read about your bit, and uh, yeah, I'm actually also here to learn. <laughs> So I guess I'll, I'll go. Uh, my name is Jonathan Pritchard. I'm the founder of the Hellstrom Group, which is a consulting company uh, spoken at BP and a whole bunch of kind of Fortune 500 companies specializing in kind of mindset, motivation, all that kind of fun stuff from a background as a mentalist and performer, just kind of like a magician that graduated to mind reading tricks, which kind of explains my planet's name. Uh, so kind of a professional mind folder. Uh, I'm here mostly out of interest. I am pretty much non-technical. I'm fascinated by the ideas behind um, Urbit and the guiding philosophies of the structure of it. I also was interested in uh, Ravencoin as a way to easily create the kind of cap sheet for companies of easily creating tokens to manage investment in a project. So I don't know if that has any applicability here as distributed ownership of a single entity of creating tokens of percentage ownership of the star or anything. I'm just interested to see where the ideas go. The end. Yeah, so, oh, Eric, do you, you're still muted, so I'm just going to jump in. Um, oh, Eric, do you want to go first? No, no, after you, please. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so uh, I'm Robert, I'm Satype, and Philip, a friend of mine, uh, we're both students here in Germany. Um, I'm doing fine, he's doing mathematics. We also came uh, to over, over Twitter, um, just retweeted to a timeline. Um, for me, Uber is more like a possibility, like a real possibility of um, localism emerging, which I don't see coming anytime soon in meat space. Um, so yeah, it's more like a political angle. As like I'm a, I'm a business student, so I have no clue about the uh, technical aspects. I, I understand, of course, how it works and what the complexity issues is with. Linux and all the file systems and why that has to collapse at some point, right? But I'm more interested in the possibilities that Orbit brings as it moves stuff away from meat space into the digital space, yeah. Mm -hmm. But also to learn. Excellent. Yeah, I'll go last. Uh, I joined for, I think, the same reason as a lot of people. I'm very interested in Orbit. I think the political implications are also very interesting. Uh, I'm not 
extremely technical, but I'm trying to grow my aptitude in uh, Hoon and, and using Urbit. And so I'd like to see how I might be able to contribute to the Urbit environment uh, on a technical level at some point in the future, hopefully the near future. And my name's Eric. Nice to see you all. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm definitely seeing some, some kind of common threads here, which is that uh, I think everybody here is interested in the project, meaning the Urbit project more generally, and is, and is here to sort of um, learn about that, but also sort of see what this, maybe this group is about in particular. And this group isn't about anything, so it could very much morph into a group of just learning about Urbit more, which is great. Like, I don't have any problem with that. Um, so um, let's, but let's talk about one thing that I think um, will, will be interesting for all of you. So, which is the, which is how how a, um, a point is owned and managed, you know, basically via via a blockchain in this case, Ethereum. So that every every ship, either a galaxy or a planet or anything anything higher than a planet, uh, is a is registered on the Ethereum blockchain, and that uh, public key is the can control that point. Which is to say that there's a list of things that a ship can do, like spawn other ships and. A, you know, a lot of other features and functionalities, which is called azimuth, it's a smart contract. And then the authority to manage your ship in azimuth is that, you know, public key or that private key that goes with that public key. Now, um, most of the time that is just, you know, something that you might manage individually with like a hardware wallet or a private key or MetaMask or something like this. But the address is the only thing that's important which means you can have contracts own Urbit address space. And the, the contract specifically that I, that I have in mind for this particular group is a multi-sig. So what would be a very straightforward thing to, in my mind to do would be to create a multi-sig of let's say four signatories with three required to make any, any transactions and then transfer the ownership of Dalton to that multi-sig. And that would just be the first step in making Dalton a collectively owned asset. Ed. Yeah, I actually have a question. Um, something that you said brought to mind the notion of a DAO yeah. and how DAOs are often seen as a sort of governance mechanism that one could put in place um, that kind of speaks to a lot of what we seem to be attempting to do with this collective. Mm -hmm. What I'm curious um, regarding what you were mentioning about the multi-sig, um, sort of like ownership of, of a single point, um, is what overlap this might have with a DAO? Or uh, is what we're uh, proposing here basically like an, an, an urban analogous DAO-like structure? I'm curious like what the overlap is between the two, um, the two ideas. Sure, so my experience in early uh, Maker, which I would very much consider much, much more idea like a DAO than it is now. I mean, now it's just a corporation, right? It's a it's a digital bank or whatever it is. But the, in the beginning, that's what it was. It was just a multi-sig that held the, the finance or the money of the group. And then everything else happened on a, like a more social layer. And then where I see Urbit coming in to really complete the circle when it comes to these structures is that, yeah, you need a blockchain to do things like decentralized finance and all these other tools in the whole decentralized finance space regardless of if they're on Ethereum or not, all of them are needed. But then most of the things that a decentralized organization does is communicate over the internet. And right now they're using things like Google Docs and Zoom and all these other sort of centralized tools, which just, and then when, when they finally do publish something, when they make their application, then it's on a web server. Like, and, and of course the web server can get taken down or hacked or whatever. So, I very much see that Urbit solving the, the, the rest of that equation, which is how do we communicate to, with each other? How can we create like access controls around things? You know, which is like to say only this group can access this chat or something like that. And as the tools for OS uh, one start to become available, uh, correct me if I'm wrong though, is, is there a um, contact list in OS one, Ed, or is that, two, or is that two? 
for that's OS one actually. End of yeah. Q one is when contact right. controls will be enabled. So now then you've got the idea of social grass, which is going to be very powerful. And so that that's really kind of what I'm seeing here, or what I'd like to see is that Urbit being a platform where most of the work gets done of a decentralized group. And then the sort of the finances are held in some sort of blockchain or like um, Jonathan was saying, like you could use Ravencoin to, to make a cap table if it's a for-profit entity, you know, that, that kind of thing. I, yeah, that, that's really where I, where I see it. But specifically with this star, you know, it has an owner on the blockchain now, which is to say it's the, pri it's the key that I hold, but I, I want to give it to something that's um, you know, collective or cooperative or just not just me. Because once that happens, that's the thing at which the, the let's call it power. Because I think a star does have, you know, it has a certain latent potential. And it, once the authority moves, the dynamics change. And that's really when things start to get interesting, I think. I'm gonna read something in the comments for the video. Also the whole urban space uh, would allow for work that's, uh, that has value inside Urbit. Most blockchain stuff is just uh, not a fiat currency to pay for the same stuff. Yeah. Um, but that being said, there are other ways that, we, that, that this is possible, right? So um, traditional companies like co-op cooperatives, which is a legal structure, can own property. So um, another option to making this star collectively managed and run is to go full legal. Like, um, you know, I could, I could pretty straightforwardly set up a cooperative someplace. I would volunteer to do that in some uh, state in the United States, probably since it would be, you know, or wherever. I mean, um, Germany has got great cooperative law too. So where, wherever the, uh, it does I, I I cannot say it, but I I, I was part of a project to set up a can you didn't staff is that how it's said anyway <laughs> um, so then it would have a legal uh, organization it would have a board of directors it would have bylaws it would have all those things but then it could also have a bank account so in this in the idea that you know fiat is still important in business which it is you need some sort of legal representation in order to make that happen. So that's another way to be thinking about it. Anybody have any other thoughts on what it means to be collectively owned? I think the, the thing you mentioned is a bit similar to the discussion between Musk and Branson and or Bezos. Mm -hmm. uh, Musk wants to go to Mars and then do the same thing in Terraform. And Branson saying, no, we don't want to go back to the planet. We want to stay in spa space and we don't have to deal with gravity. Uh, do, do you want to then have all the legal problems again? Or maybe you don't want to do that? Well, pushing the metaphor a little bit, uh, living in, gra in zero G, uh, that, that'll kill you. So, I mean. Yeah, but not the DAO. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm, I'm pragmatic, meaning the, the set of options that this group might be considering shouldn't be just, I don't think they should be just limited to the, the sort of blockchain space. Mm -hmm. That being said, I have my own preference, which is to say, I think it's far easier to do business on the internet if you're internet native and just go that, go that route, especially if that's sort of uh, where Urbit is headed. But I can also see Urbit being very relevant to local communities. So it's hard for me to say exactly where, where the, the, you know, the positive and, you know, I, I would like Dalton to be very robust and very um, independent, which is to say not have some sort of legal jurisdiction or not have that legal jurisdiction be, be almost be like um, something that is used by the digital entity. Like, you know, if it got shut down or turned off, it wouldn't be a big deal kind of a thing. But it could be useful to have fiat money. Are those options mutually exclusive, do you think? No. And but, could you have the one stacked on the other? Sorry. Um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, no, I don't. But it's, um, 
they're at, at least somewhat uh, philosophically potentially exclusive. Hmm. Um, isn't it that you can move your star? So if you're a planet, you can decide which is your star. Uh, so this, what was the question again? Yeah. You born by a star, but after that you can decide if you want to abandon your parent and so yeah. when you you can yeah. always leave and, and vice versa. You can always attractive. attract customers. Yeah, but so it's also incentive to not only let people deal with Dalton, but that they choose him as their solar system, right? Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine that if Dalton is successful as a business, if that's where it wants to go, um, of course it can spawn 65,000 of its own planets and sell them and then have those people pay fees or whatever. But I think it would actually be more interesting if it had more than that, meaning it was in, it was very good uptime. It had all the right, you know, services that people would want. And then people's, they, I don't think moving from star to star should be a big deal. I think people should do it actually frequently given, given like a better deal, right? If I could change my ISP, my internet service provider as often as I'd like to get a better deal, like I would, but I'm locked into a local monopoly. I only have three or four choices. I escaped a star. My first ship was, uh, from open sea yeah. and it was under a, a dark star. I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> so the urban live dudes helped me escape to, to theirs. And it's been great ever since. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think urban live for sure is, is becoming the de facto sort of hosting provider at the moment. Like mm -hmm. th those are the ones that everybody knows. They've got a really good website. They have really good uptime. They also really care about this space. Uh, yeah, want to be like them. Like all the stars that I own, I want them to be like Urban Life, if not better. Um, I don't know how much, I read a little bit about the Egen stuff, but I don't know how far that is developed even internally or if it just was just an idea of it, they, they figured out themselves. Because that's obviously in tandem, right? If you have a star, mm -hmm. probably you also have a community around that star. There's probably benefits of being in the Egen versus not being in the Egen, right? All these things. Um, do you want to combine Delta with Delta and Egen, or, or what Delta? What's the name of the star again? Dalton. Dalton is the name of this, mm -hmm. this star under the Ten Galaxy. So how far is the whole Egen thing? Is there any, it's really just, I, I read just some parts on the, the Orbit blog. That's a possibility, but I know you, you are more the inside for us as you're an edge, right? Yeah. So, so the word you're using, e, is it Egen? Yeah, the, the community layer of Orbit yeah. that is oh, like down the road. Yeah. Um, okay, so what, even though it does have a name, it doesn't have any structure around it. It's more of an aspirational idea. Um, to, to bring it down and to bring it more concrete of, of where I've been thinking about um, communities as they relate to Urbit is really more right now it's onboarding. Like if we, if there was an organization or th there's a few actually that we've been speaking to, one of them is named Dorg and it's a group uh, building Ethereum devs working on sort of for hire smart contract work. And they really just liked, you know, the fact that they were using Discord for all of their messaging and they were using Google Docs and all this other stuff. So they really like Urbit for basic communications, which is chat and blogging. That's the only really two things that they could use it for, for the most part. But they're going to be using it for themselves. Whereas most of us, I would guess, we spend a lot of time on Urbit help because that's where like the most socialness happens. They don't really care about Urbit help. They just want their own thing over there. And they don't really need to worry about anything else. So that's like a community that we're focused on and thinking about right now. You could think of it um, as this city's idea. Uh, but I anticipate more and more groups are going to start coming on to Urbit for their own sake. And they don't really care about anybody else. It's just their own community. But they are interested in, get, in getting new functions and features. So as those things become more specific to groups of people, 
and especially as um, the, the difference between interface and data becomes more sort of understood and it's easier to con like conceive how you might sort of mix and match different presentations with different functionalities, then I, see, I think you'll start to see some more structure coming around these, right, these ideas. I don't know, Ed, what do you think? I was actually just <clears throat> Uh, Refamiliarizing myself with the uh, Aegean, or a, I think Aegean or something, however you pronounce it, that sort of construct or concept that was developed quite a while back. And um, while we're not using that word particularly anymore, um, it's just been replaced with the notion of groups, which we basically did for like a readability or like a legibility out of, out of that concern. Um, a lot of what we're working on in terms of groups is having this uh, this construct, so to speak, be something that isn't exactly mapped to the um, the network infrastructure, which is the sort of network of stars, planets, and moons. Um, so I think a lot of the things that were originally expressed in the original spec for what um, for what Asian was, which was a pattern for building cities, this is all being replicated now in groups, such that um, similar to what Kenny was saying. We can almost imagine that one could spin up a city or a group um, with with respect to like a local um, like a local sort of a group that you might be a part of like a gym for example might have its own group um, or another example is like a hacker space for example or as I mentioned earlier even something like a startup could not necessarily be mapped to a star uh, which was what I was curious about earlier and what I mentioned but you can imagine that just being mapped simply to a group now, what makes this really interesting and what I was discussing about in um, Urban Help was the notion of how um, each of these groups could really begin to manifest their own configurations of software in incredibly particular ways, such that a group might have a shared wallet, for example, if they needed to manage funds collectively for whatever reason, or uh, a particular group might be able to make use of, like, um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like pulling um, examples out of a hat. But the idea of like a like a a voice based like radio application, for example, for maybe rangers who are operating in a forest to manage an urban group that for their own work, um, we can imagine each of these structures to basically just serve as this sort of uh, base, so to speak, from which a lot of these applications could spring on like a per sort of group basis. So um, I, I don't know if that helps any anyway, but I was just trying to fill in the rest of that picture and kind of bridge that gap between how this idea was expressed earlier with how we're working on it now, which I would say isn't too different. We're just using different phrases and words. Cool. Um, and, and Ed, could you talk to also that idea that I don't think is actually really well known, which is that um, data and presentation, how those th are things are related and not related in, in Urbit and how that might sort of inform a lot of how these things evolve over time. Certainly, yeah. The, um, there's two specific phrases that, as Kenny mentioned, are really undefined, but there's sort of this ongoing nascent theory development that the interface team is working around, which is the notion of regular assemblies is one idea. The second related idea to this are uh, shell interfaces. And to break these down, um, for those of you who are at all familiar with a lot of um, kind of mainstream application development on the web, there's this ongoing notion, and you could maybe even call it a meme of design systems, which are meant to be replicable um, means of organizing interfaces such that it should be easy for developers and designers to like, um, to whip up an interface for one use case or another, and to have a lot of the interfaces within an organization remain a solid whole. Now, the interesting thing about the ways that design systems are expressed uh, today in the current world is that one, they're primarily visual. They're just purely concerned with this sort of visual expression and not so much the data that's being um, piped into these representations. And two, in a very real way, these design systems are sort of like HR constructs. They're meant to basically smooth um, the sort of working surface area between developers who tend to out outnumber designers 
um, such that developers can just spin up interfaces whenever they need to without having to rely on designers to do uh, any sort of um, detail heavy work. So there's this sort of ongoing critique, I would say, that a few of us are interested in, which is to say that what Urbit is promising is a world where the data is all sort of like one very, very solid thing, almost mechanical in a way, and using the system of auras, for those of you who, are, um, who, who know it, how Hoon works, and um, casting, you can almost imagine that you could bring to bear the idea of casting in auras, which is kind of a Hoon construct right now, into the world of interfaces, um, such that you could have a bit of interface that could nominally be represented as the kind of concept of human communication, but we could also cast that into the linear chat, or we could cast this abstract concept of human communication to a forum or into voice. Or um, uh, Kenny and I were joking about how eventually we might be able to cast um, urbit data into like smells. So rather than having avatar-based representations of a human being, you could have like a scent-based representation of another person. So someone could smell like a pine tree, for example, on the network, which is obviously like a fanciful idea. But that just gets to the heart of what we're talking about, which is that Urbit promises a world where you have a sort of solid notion of what data is and how it's represented. And what we're theorizing is that we could maybe bring that to bear in the interface world. And this sort of brings to mind how applications might someday operate in the context of groups, which is right now what we're used to are app stores that allow you to download like a packaged application and this application doesn't really play well with a lot of other applications that exist out there. For example, on Discord, I can use voice chat, but for whatever reason, I can't do that in Slack, or I can't necessarily do that um, natively in a lot of other applications. And so rather than the idea of applications, which are these sort of heavily boxed and heavily sandboxed ideas of what functionality could be, something that we're playing around with and experimenting at a very early level on the interface team is the notion of arrangements which are bits of functionality that one could cast into various representations such that you might have a linear chat that you could then append to a book. So you have a chat within the context of a book, like an ebook, for example. So you and your reading group could then begin to discuss the book in line with this chat or have the chat um, basically nestled in, in, the, the, um, in the margin of a book along with like annotation functions and such. So what we're imagining is a world in which a lot of this functionality that we kind of take for granted that is very solid in a very real way, like linear chat is essentially a solved problem. Forums are essentially a solved problem. That is tree-based chat. Um, there are a lot of problems that are basically solved and have yet to really truly crystallize as, as elements that one can manipulate with, with respect to digital applications. The one really crucial example here is that right now in HTML, you can author a line of text, you can author a quote, but you can't author a chat for some reason. You can't write bracket, chat, bracket, and just manifest a, a chat within the context of HTML, even though linear chat is something that everybody re-implements to some degree um, on the internet and on the present stack. And so what we're really interested in is of that sort of level of allowing people to build their own interfaces from a very fundamental level. Yeah. And yeah. what I sort of imagine this sort of looking like in the future is instead of having app stores, you might have things like data type directories. Whereas if you build a new sort of feature or function as a, it would be a type of data. So it, what Ed is saying is sort of like chat. Think of it as like a structured standard, at, at least in some way. Uh, and that you'd have this sort of list of things or directory or even like, um, and then you, you can arrange those things into sort of either different or fluid interfaces or static interfaces, right? So you could, you, we could finally come back to the day where, you know, if you have something that's really useful for you, it never goes away. It never changes. It never looks different. And like, that is so weird to think about in our sort of world where, you know, interfaces are kind of dragged out from underneath us and whole services are just killed off because, you know, they didn't serve the needs of a, of a wide range of population as opposed to like a niche range. But when you're in control of your own computing interface and data, it's as relevant to you 
that, that you're the only one that matters in terms of like, is it important to keep or not? Because the person on the other end of that social connection has something else completely different as well. So in that example Ed gave about the book, you could also imagine somebody that's like, I don't care about the book. I just want to read the chat. And then all it looks like is a chat window. Or maybe even that's how they found the book club in the first place. And that's how you actually get an invitation to the book club. And then you can see the book or something like that. There are lots of, it kind of changes the way things um, sort of work, I think, which is really interesting to be thinking about. Okay. So uh, um, I, I am kind of sensing from this group that more of this sort of thing, meaning talking about Urbit, explaining what it is that we know and how we know it, um, could have benefit to, to this group. Is that, am I feeling that correctly? Uh, I would, as a novice, I would say I feel that strongly, especially because if you look at around YouTube or something, mm -hmm. you have some Lambda conference talk from 2018. It's like a three minute video of Anton where he explains what Urbit is from like a few years ago, but there's not much going on. And just by reading the blog, or oh, it's also not that, yeah. Okay. Not that, yeah, explained, I would say, to you correct. So how about, um, and I've kind of seen this from multiple people, is that the general thing people want or have is interest. And so um, still be do, please do think about what it means to have a star collectively owned, but I don't think we're gonna do anything about that right now. It could just sit here, in, in, you know, once this group sort of solidifies into something more cohesive, that would be great. But what I would like to do is maybe organize the Dalton Collective more around um, sharing of information and learning. So um, maybe I can go back to the team. Uh, so next week, there's going to be a Talon offsite, which will be a good chance for me to chat with people face to face. And, you know, what we could do maybe is sort of like, well, have regular meetings like this, but it's more question answer, maybe even small presentations, so that Urbit itself can get, or the development team, meaning mostly Talon at this point, can share some information a little bit more. Does that sound like something that people would be interested in? I'd be really interested in that. We already in orbit. All of us are already in orbit, right? So it's kind of we meet already on orbit to get information. If you could just upload it to YouTube, I think that would be also very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there are six people in this group, and I don't know how many more. Sure, but mm -hmm. I think it's a bit capped. Sure. Um, so I would. I do want to make sure everybody is in the the Dalton Collective chat room which is, um, it's just, I know, okay. So if there's anybody who's not put your planet name in the chat right now and I'll, I'll, I'll add you in. I will uh, do that once I, once I got in there because as I said, I'm complete novice. I, I don't know anything. I'm just here to learn, but. Uh, okay, no worries. Okay. Can, we do, can, I, can I talk about you on Twitter to, to get you that? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, if you know where I, go ahead and contact yeah. me there. Okay, so that's what I'll do. I will, um, so next week, I'll chat with some folks about doing this again, put out some more information. I'll, I'll do it on the two mediums I can, I'll, I'll promise to is uh, Twitter, which is just my Twitter handle, and then um, also the internal group in, um, on Urbit itself. But if you have any other thing about topics you wanna think about or thinking about with Urbit, drop them there, I'll make sure to read it. Um, also be thinking about if you have any ideas about what to do with this star. I think it would be cool to have uh, like a notebook mm -hmm. made by maybe just uh, similar to the, uh, I don't know if all of you saw it, but the, um, the notebook where all the chats and notebooks are listed in the comments. Maybe we just have such an idea hub mm -hmm. for what we could do. And then if everybody puts in like 10 ideas, I'm sure some pop out that are actually useful. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to put some notes in from this meeting in, into a journal and then just publish them there. So let me just make sure I got everybody's cool stuff. Before. These are, yeah, these are cool ideas because over Christmas I was, I was talking to my dad. He's, he's had a stroke. He, he's, he's really, he's like, oh, I would love to have a planet, but I'm not ready to be his 
cis admin for running his own planet. So I was thinking, well, maybe I spool up a moon and I run it and then just give him the landscape access to it. So then that way I could manage through client his access via landscape and facilitate his access to the right information, which is kind of cool. So it's all it's already kind of happening on the planet conflict moon level. So it's just neat to see it fractal abstract out to other layers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've definitely been thinking about the sort of like, what does it mean to be a sysadmin for Urbit? Which is not to say that it's necessarily like what we have now where they have a lot of control actually, but it's more like um, a shepherd, meaning helping everybody get their stuff together. It's very servant oriented as opposed to where sysadmins have a lot of power. So they're just jerks most of the time. But um, that's going to be something I'm sort of been experimenting with this is going to be like how to help large groups of people get on and stay on orbit. If, if it's, if it's how, like how manageable is that? How many people can I take on that kind of thing? Yeah. So that, that's something that has been hitting my radar is I'm in a lot of Twitter direct message group conversations and Twitter can hear all of it everywhere. So I was like, you guys are trying to have conversations, but there's still always the panopticon listening to everything. Mm -hmm. Everything we're doing here, we can do in urban. So come on over. And I'm like, oh, yes, interesting. I was like, I'll just set it up for you. Just yeah. come on over. Yeah. Just do it. I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I'll offer myself for, uh, if anybody has, you know, they get stuck and they don't know who to call. Just, just call me. I'll, I'll help <laughs> as much as I can, which is mostly like, did you turn it off and turn it back on? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everybody. Um, unless there's anything else anybody wants to chat about. Cool. So yeah, I'll put up some notes on the, the Dalton uh, journal. Well, I'll have to create it first. And then um, I'll have an open question in there about, and just go ahead, drop in some comments, put it in the chat, whatever. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully, I think we should be able to get, um, you know, I'll probably ask Galen if he wants to sort of at least do an, uh, an ask me anything type of thing here. And then, uh, yeah, if, if, they, if the conversations become interesting, we should post them as well. Um, or, or even, push the devs to figure out how we can share video in Urbit instead of just putting everything on YouTube. Yeah, I have some ideas about financial intermediaries that could work. Let's say you could, for example, make between planets as a star, so simple uh, loan and saving operations, right? Nice. Yeah, but, and I think the reputation of stars would be very beneficial. Yes, assuming that they do have good reputations. Yeah. <laughs> Until they <laughs> yeah, which I mean, if you think about it too, just think about it in the future. The people who are, or the, the the actors that are moving now are likely to have some of the best reputation moving forward. Like Urbit Live, those guys are stellar, right? Everybody already knows that. <laughs> and if this group or this star can start doing something similar to that, then it also potentially could have a business advantage at some point in the future when Urbit becomes more economically viable, like internally. On that note, that actually gets me thinking too that with respect to the overall project or the greater project of a collective star and the ownership of that, something that we should all turn over in our minds is this notion of what businesses might be good to start on Urbit at this early point in time. Urbit Live is obviously genius because, you know, it's, uh, it's serving as a sort of educational pipeline and a planet or ship obtaining pipeline for a lot of new people to Urbit. And I'm curious, like, what other early stage sort of uh, services, you know, this group could collectively imagine in terms of what might be useful for early uh, urban years to, uh, to uh, use, you know, anything like that would be really cool. Yep, agreed. Okay, everybody, thanks. And uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep in touch and we'll, we'll see you sometime in the next few weeks. Cool, thanks for having us. Right. Bye. Oh, yeah. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen.